Good afternoon, and thank you for joining this event on Building Peace from the Inside Out, a conversation about Sierra Leone's Fumble Talk program and the transformative power of locally led solutions. I want to extend a special thank you to Minister Al Ghali uh, and to all of our panelists for joining us in person today. Uh, my name is Corrine Graf, and I'm a senior advisor for conflict prevention and fragility at the United States Institute of Peace which was established by the U.S. Congress in 1984 as a nonpartisan public institution dedicated to helping prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflicts. We are delighted to co-host today's event with the foundation Catalyst for Peace to discuss a timely new book by its founder and president, Libby Hoffman, who is here with us today. In a moment, Libby will share with us her journey as a peace builder, author, and as co-founder of the Community Reconciliation Program, Fumble Talk, which is at the center of her new book. The book's release is very timely, in part because it coincides with an ongoing debate here in Washington and in other capitals around the world about the role of aid localization. That is, how to improve aid programs by forging closer partnerships between donors and national and local actors, including the communities most directly impacted by aid. To be clear, the debate on this issue is not about principle or whether working more directly with local leaders is the right thing to do. There is broad agreement on this. The benefits of increased localization uh, include improved trust, access on the ground, speed of response, responsiveness to community needs, and the sustainability of programs. It may also be more cost effective to work directly with local actors. A recent study by the Share Trust estimates that delivering aid and peace programs through local organizations could be 32% more cost efficient than working through international for-profit implementing organizations. And so organizations like US Agency for International Development are raising their ambition and commitment to localization. USAID recently committed to redirect the development funding that it provides directly to local partners, raising the share of aid it will provide to those partners to 25% of its total budget by 2025. But what is still very much under debate, particularly in international aid agencies, is the question of how to deepen partnerships with local actors and what localization actually means and looks like in practice. Some of the questions that are percolating here in Washington and policy circles include what do successful partnerships between international actors, national leaders, and gov local governments and communities look like on the ground? What are the tools and mechanisms needed to put local communities in the lead to design and implement programs? And where and how are donors in position to better support local actors in responding to local challenges? I can't think of a better group of panelists that is better positioned to help us explore these questions than the individuals who are here with us today. Their engagement with Fumble Talk and Sierra Leone's One Fumble National Framework, a participatory pl policy planning process that is rooted in communities, offers us a unique opportunity to learn from a concrete example of localization that has been brought to scale nationally. So with us, in addition to Libby Hoffman, we have Minister of State in the Office of the Vice President of the Republic of Sierra Leone, Francis Algali, uh, John Kalker, who's Executive Director of Fumble Talk, and Dr. Sani Joseph, Vice President of the Africa Center here at USIP. Welcome. Um, for those tuning in online, you can take part in today's discussion by asking a question using the chat box function located on the USIP event page, and we'll do our best to address as many of your questions as possible. So with that, Libby, I'd like to start with you. Um, you've just released your book. Uh, the answers are there, Building Peace from the Inside Out. Um, could you tell us what the book is about, and could you share with us a little bit about your journey and how you came to work on local peace building in Sierra Leone? Sure. Thank you, Corinne. First of all, thank you uh, to you and to USIP for hosting us in this conversation. I think this is absolutely the perfect time to magnify this story and this conversation, and we're really thrilled to be a part of it, so I appreciate that. Um, so the book is about the last 15 years of my work in Sierra Leone alongside John Cocker and in the last several years alongside the government of Sierra Leone also um, building a program that puts the people and communities of Sierra Leone 
um, at the center and in charge first of their own post-war reconciliation and then adapting that into a people's-led planning and development process. Um, and so it tells those stories while it weaves in the framework behind that, the, the, sis, the, def, the different components of the system of the way we had to work to accomplish that. And then it also weaves in my own journey as a, as a person, as a leader, and what I had to learn in order to work that way, and the nature, uh, what this partnership and this work required of me in, um, in order to be a part of and to support it. So it weaves all of those things um, together, and it springs from, in my own experience, I had been um, a, po a political science professor. Um, at, at a college, and while I loved that work, I was always more oriented towards activism than, um, you know, just research. And so I left academia because I really wanted to, to do the work of conflict resolution and peace building. And not long after, um, I had a windfall uh, and actually came into $20 million um, through uh, my father having taken his company public. And so now all of a sudden, this work that I wanted, I, that I was on the grantee side of, I now had an opportunity to be a grantor and to use those resources to create the work that I wanted to see. And what I really wanted to do, I had seen so much locally led peace building that was incredibly powerful and effective all around the world, but it was isolated and episodic. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in what are the systems, the structures that support local ownership and leadership at the systemic scale, and how do we live into that? How can the people and communities most impacted by war, in particular, be the ones that, that get to lead? What are the systems that support that? And decided to use our resources to live into that. I thought the only way we can actually learn that is in practice. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to do um, a sort of unique approach to funding, spending down the endowment over roughly 20 years, and focus on granting to fewer places and going deeper and longer term. And five years into that process, I met John Cocker, and the synchronicity in our visions was incredible. And he had this vision for a, a reconciliation process in his country after the special court, after the TRC, one that was really drawing on their culture and their community, and that was based at the local level, um, centered around bringing communities together in a restorative justice process of truth-telling, apology, and forgiveness. And so when we came together to work on that, um, it began this partnership that led to living out these ideas in process and learning as, as we went. Um, and so that's the, the story that I'm telling in the book, and that's a little bit about my, my motivation and what got me, got me into it. Well, thank you. Um, so to get to the core of your book and yeah. the title, um, you talk about an inside-out approach. Yeah. Um, so I imagine most of our viewers are familiar with what a, a bottom-up approach, but what, what do you mean by an inside-out approach? What's the distinction between that and, and bottom-up? Yeah. Well, one of the things, as we have lived into this work, so our vision was not only to do a community-centered reconciliation process, where the communities were running their own reconciliation process, but we wanted to do it at the national scale. So how do you simultaneously create a process where communities are leading, but you're actually organizing in a way that helps that to roll out nationwide? And as we did that, um, a couple key concepts um, emerged. And if I can, I think this might be a time actually to show it visually, if that's all right. Absolutely. So the, um, and we'll hear more of the stories, I think, as we go. And I know John will speak to that. But if I can just sort of set the framework for it, because I think it's foundational. If you look at, um, in whether it's peace building and, or development or whatever um, the humanitarian work is, the community that has a challenge is like a, a cup or a, a bowl. Um, and so the, in this case, the, the issue was a need for reconciliation after the war, but it could have been lack of um, access to education or healthcare or whatever the issues is. Um, in a traditional aid system, the aid coming in to help is like water in a bottle. And so typically what happens is the aid just comes in into the community and pours in, but it goes right through because the cup itself is broken. 
Now the cup, the community, is invisible in the international system is what we have found. And so the response, though, out of a desire people want to help is to pour more water in, right? And that just, oftentimes it actually widens the cracks in the cup and it depletes the resources. And it's a flow of resources one way. And you could say that that's from the top down or you could say it's from the outside in. But in any case, the, the cup is invisible. Fumble Talk's work wasn't about pouring water and it was about repairing the cup. And what we found was that when you repaired the cup, the community itself obviously could then hold the resources, but it actually became more than that. It became like a well that tapped into the reserves of groundwater in the community. When they were working together, what they could accomplish on their own without even needing additional outside aid was phenomenal. And so that sets the stage for an inside out. So if you have the local community, Fumble Talk organized and supported that um, by gathering communities together in sections and then aggregated that to the chiefdom, which is the next structure, kind of like a county um, in the United States. Um, and then supported that at the chiefdom level. In the second iteration, that's focused on people's led planning with the national framework, that culminates in a chiefdom people's plan where the people are de deciding for themselves what they want in their own development and how they want to go about it. That's then aggregated and supported at the district level. And Fumble Talk first supported reconciliation, led it through building a network of volunteers who led it at the district level, and now the people's planning process with the local government bringing them together in inclusive ways till they lead it. And then that's supported at the national level. Um, and first by Fumble Talk as a national civil society and now also with the government. And then supported internationally. Now each one of these is its own bowl, its own container. And the work of holding and repairing the container that's holding it. So this was the image of our work. This was the vision of the structure, the, the framework, the architecture of the piece in the organization of it that we were looking at. And if you look at this, there is no top or bottom. I mean, you could be in the international arena up here or down here. The flow and what we, how we would define a, a current traditional aid system is it works from the outside in. There's a one directional flow of resources. Um, but because we see the communities that are facing the challenges as actually having abundant resources, the answers are there within the communities. The role of outsiders isn't to solve those problems or um, fix, you know, bring in their expertise. It's actually to honor the resources that are there, the expertise, and magnify it out. And share it out at these other levels and to build the community's capacity to work together to do it. So in this model, the flow from the inside out, it rejects, if you think of the system as top down, the alternative is bottom up, but that still preserves a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. There are distinct roles at every level, national government, international, whether they're private foundations or governments, uh, national governments, national civil society, local government, community leaders, community participants, all of those are distinct roles. There's not a hierarchy in them. They're just distinct and they're at levels, levels of closeness to the issue being addressed or further away. And so when you think about that, it gives you a more holistic framework um, that allows you to envision resources actually as flowing both ways. And even though in the, the early part of our relationship, I was the major funder also, Catalyst for Peace was, of the Fumble Talk work, everything we structured I received as much as I gave, right? And I think we've all had those experiences, but we structured that in where the flow is inside out um, as much as outside in. So that's the summary of um, uh, the, the framework that, um, that, that really emerged from our work, the articulation of it that emerged from our work. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm really glad you brought the nesting bulls because it really captures what you're doing in such a vivid way. I have a lot of follow-up questions, but I want to move on to uh, John um, and ask John, for those who don't know Fumble Talk, um, could you tell us a little bit about its origins, the origins of the program, and the circumstances that led you as a human rights uh, activist to establish the community-based program? Thank you very much. Um, well, first, as a human rights advocate, uh, I'll normally say activist, you know, someone who monitored the uh, conflict, 
and linked with um, several other international organizations. I was concerned, you know, by then that um, mm. the way the the way the conflict was brought to an end, you know, the decision making was more from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, we had a peace agreement, we had a truth commission, we had experts who came in to lead the process. Um, we had a special court letter. Um, the consultants who led the Truth Commission you know, were all from outside, very good people. But by then, I was really concerned that, look, we don't need to copycat the South Africa model. We don't need to copycat um, ch the Chilean model, the Guatemalan model, you know, uh, the Zimbabwean Catholic uh, memorial model. I said, look, as a country, as a nation, we went through a unique conflict. We went through a conflict that was difficult to describe. Mm -hmm. And I trust the process. Let's find ways to find solutions, you know, to, to sort of to allow us to move on. Now, I remember when the um, governments we were negotiating in um, Togo, in Togo, Lome, um, I spoke to the then um, presidential affairs minister. I know I appealed to him and to the Attorney General then say, please, 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 don't resort to the quick fix. That is, the war is over, blanket amnesty, let's move on. So they assured me that there will be no quick fix. Uh, but at the end of the day, that was what we got. As a nation, there was sort of, okay, the war is over, let's move on. Um, power sharing, you know, the rebel leader was given the position of equivalent to vice president. And okay, you are fighting for all these minerals. You are in charge of the minerals now. So um, as a human rights advocate, we said, no, this will not work well. But we were also tired of the conflict. We wanted to move on as a nation. So my colleagues, you know, we galvanized and said, look, what can we do? Some suggested, let's challenge the peace agreement in the courts because this will not go down well for us as a nation. And I said, no, I think, you know, when the agreement was signed, People of Sierra Leone don't know what was in the agreement, but we all just rejoiced. The war is over, let's move on. So okay, I said, let's study the agreement and see how can we use the provisions in this agreement to further um, address the issue of impunity. So we, uh, we organized ourselves into what we describe as the TRC working group, the Truth and Reconstitution working group, which I was the national chairman for a coalition of over 100 um, civil society groups across the country. So we tried to influence you know, the establishment of the Truth Commission. We worked very hard. But at the end of the day, you know, it was more back and forth, back and forth. It was almost the same like South Africa, because that's what they know. Um, you know. So as an advocate, back and forth, I said, OK, I will not continue this struggle. Let's wait at the end of the Truth Commission. We have all the time to continue with discussion. So I suggested to the um, consultant, let's work at the community level. Let's have a unique process where we have community truth processes that will feed into the official truth commission. And I said, no, it has never worked. It, it will not work, etc. So I said, OK, fine. So then the, um, the report was handed over, the special court. You know, I was so frustrated. And as someone who helped negotiate the agreements with the amputees and war wounded, you know, I was stuck because I promised the amputees and war wounded that let them cooperate because there will be a reparations program. So with all of that, I was in that sort of um, conundrum where, you know, what do we do next? Even the uh, special fund for war victims was not forthcoming by then. So I decided to take time off, you know, to come out. I, I, I had a fellowship at Colombia. So then I met with um, Libby. You know, I described my vision. I said, look, I believe we have a way to address our, our problem. You know, what has been done is more of the surface. You know, the special court, about 500 million to try about 10 people, 500 million dollars. The truth commission, about four to five million for the whole country. There was little or nothing for the um, special fund for war victims. So I said, look, let's go back to the people. Let's consult with them and let's find ways to get their own input. And I believe they have the answers. So that's how we started. I said, OK. Uh, Libby asked me for a concept note. I said, look, it's difficult to even come up with a concept note. What I know is I can describe the process. Let's just go in and consult. 
let's have um, first. I, 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 I wanted to suggest um, chiefdom consultations, but it will take more time. I said, okay, let's have district consultations. As soon as we um, had the first consultation, you know, asking people, do you want to forgive? How do you want to go about that? What exists in, in your community? No one has asked us this question before. No one has come to us to talk about what we want to do. I said, okay. So I called Libby. I said, look, I think the people are ready to engage. Okay, but let's continue with this consultation. First, second, third, the same thing. You know, we asked them, um, who bears the greatest responsibility? So them is the people, the person next door. It's not the leader of the rebels who they don't know. It's not the um, commander who they don't know. It's the person next door, you know, who burned down their house, who killed their loved one. So basically, you know, I have this baggage of being a human rights advocate, and now I'm trying to see how I can lead a peace process, you know, uh, getting people to talk about finding their own solutions. So the first decision was, mm, I think it will be difficult to continue with the human rights baggage, you know, as someone who I've been always you know, raising issues with the government, press release. I want to start from a new page. So that's how we, we decide to form Family Talk. Family Talk is Creole for family talk. Because we believe we are a family. Before the war, we used to be one family. You know, you see a mother, you, you see an elderly person carrying um, water, he heavy load. You stop. You don't need to be related to that person. You stop to help. You see a child going the wrong way. You don't need to be the biological father or mother of that child. You stop, to, to stop to find ways. You know, it, there, there is this adage, it takes a village to raise the child. You know, I remember community will come together to contribute, to send the brightest child to go to university. What went wrong? I trusted the process that, look, something went wrong. Let's find a way to move on. So that's the uh, genesis of Fambu Talk. We decided to um, form this organization to say, okay, look, let's start from, the, um, from a new page. Let's see what we can do. So basically, that's how Family Talk was uh, established. And our work was to facilitate this process. We believe, um, you know, we, we were guided by values. Value number one, we are not experts. The people are the experts. Mm -hmm. They know what they want. No, number two, how do we work in a way that, that is non-political and non-partisan? You know, in a way that people will see it as their own program. They own it. And also, how do you avoid bringing people to the big towns? You know, having a conversation within the security and safety of their communities, where they can speak freely. So that's, these are among other things that guided the process. And once we started, people were so willing, they were so engaged, and that's how we were able to organize over 250 um, ceremonies with um, hundreds of um, villages, you know, allowing people, uh, victims, perpetrators, to tell their story, you know, about what happened during the conflict. You know, to talk, because the development um, process was a little bit challenge. You know, you come to a village where, you know, I live next door to the person that I burnt, I, I, you know, I killed their, their child or loved one. And if they call us to a meeting because an NGO is coming in, you know, I won't sit in that, in that meeting because he or she is there. When, you know, I have something that is difficult. You know. So anyway, so basically the process created that environment for us to talk about what happened. And then the next stage was where we are now. That is, the people are ready to move on into development processes. Once the healing has taken place at that level, they are ready now to step into their, into their next stage. Thank you very much for that, John. And especially for making the contrast between the outside in and the, the inside out approaches. I think that came out very clearly from your, your presentation. I want to turn to Minister Al Ghali um, because the government of Sierra Leone um, has really latched onto this program and forged a really unique partnership um, around this program and is currently expanding it, from what I understand, to build a national process of participatory policy planning. So I want to ask you, uh, Minister, if you could speak a little bit about what motivated the government of Sierra Leone to do this and, and why, more generally, would governments want to work with these uh, local level partnerships? Okay, thank you very much. I never knew that the United States had an institute for peace, so <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is really really most welcome. I'm happy to be here. 
Um, in 2018, I joined the government. I have a background of uh, human rights and education. So when the government came to power, I was invited to become a minister of state in the office of the vice president after an election that was really peaceful. Although we had isolated incidences of violence during the elections and uh, there was a uh, movement of people. So His Excellency the President called the Vice President and asked him to see why um, there was this violence, isolated and sporadic violence, and to see whether something can be done to strengthen social cohesion. And uh, the Honorable Vice President uh, tried to interrogate some of the structures because a lot of investment was made in Sierra Leone after the war. We had security, um, security structures, we had district structures, we had provincial structures. So uh, we decided to work with the UNDP then to look at the areas where there were isolated cases of uh, violence to see what some of the issues were. And one of the organizations which uh, we worked with to look at these issues was uh, Fumble Talk, because everybody in Sierra Leone used Fumble Talk and they work in conflict resolution. And uh, when they sent the report, we noticed that in areas where there were no chiefdom structures at the chiefdom level, the community level, the tendency to violence was high. But in areas where there were chiefdom structures, they were able to solve the issues very quickly and the violence did not spread. So we noticed that um, during the peace, uh, uh, peace building structures, mm -hmm. it was stopped at the district level. It did not drill down to the chiefdom level. And conflict always begins in communities. And the fact that Fumble Talk had a community led program that starts with the micro, the little minute villages, uh, you know, we thought it would be a good idea for the, the Ministry of Local Government to see whether they could adopt these structures. Let me take an example. In one of the, the areas, what came out was that there was a conflict between the speaker and the paramount chief. The speaker supported one political party, the paramount chief supported an other political party. So the people were afraid. Nobody wanted to associate with the paramount chief, the other, you know. And when we interrogated, the people said, just make peace between the, with the speaker and the paramount chief, and everything is OK. We have no problem, because we don't want to fight each other. But if the two chiefs, the two heads are fighting, we have no choice but to fight. So simple issues like that. So we looked at it from a peace building and social cohesion perspective, and we thought it was a good thing for us. The second thing, we also looked at it from a developmental perspective, because there was a case of one village where there was a high level of maternal mortality, and uh, the Ministry of Health just looked at the statistics and said, we need to build a maternal health post here. There, there's need for a hospital in this village. And uh, speaking to the people, the people were saying, no, we don't need a hospital. It's not a hospital we need. Just make the road for us. And there's a hospital three miles away. So why do you want to come and build a, a hospital for us? So it dawned on us that there was need to involve the people in terms of social cohesion and peace building. And uh, there was already a process in Sierra Leone which we had not been using. And we thought that as a government, if we tried to expand and pilot this process to other villages, maybe we would have found an answer to strengthen our social cohesion, as well as strengthening our development. So the Honorable Vice President asked me to call a meeting between the Ministry of Planning and the Ministry of Local Government and Fumble Talk. And that was how the partnership started. We have been working together to see how we can pilot this um, program into more areas in Sierra Leone. But also, it led the government to understand the richness of civil society work and civil society partnership. 
So um, one of the innovations we also did was to uh, establish a government and civil society dialogue platform, dialogue series, so that um, the civil society could organize themselves and invite government to dialogue on any issues that they believe are issues that government need to know about or they can work with government to, to, to address. And the government can also call civil society to discuss certain issues which they think civil society can help to ensure that there's development and there's social cohesion. So this is how we stumbled into the program. But one of the, the, the things that we noticed as a government, it's very difficult for um, international organizations and NGOs and donors to support processes. This, was, this um, program was a process. It was a means to an end. It was not uh, like, uh, oh, we have uh, the objectives, we need to build a school, we need to do infrastructure here, we need to set up this. It was supporting a process whereby people are engaged, people discuss, and people come up with solutions, and we accompany them. So it was difficult for us to, to see how we could engage the international community, to engage donors to see how they can support processes, because we noticed and we saw the value in this process. So as a government, we allocated resources to it through the Ministry of Planning and Development to pilot and see how we can expand it to different, different districts. And the results are there. The testimonies are there for, for people to see what can be achieved if you involve communities in this way and if you put people at the center of their own development. There's so much you can get out of it. And development would be sustainable. We don't need to write a book about sustainable development. The people themselves can sustain their own development if we work in this way. So this is how the government came into it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Minister. And you know, I think one of the really unique aspects of mm -hmm. this program and Fumble Talk mm -hmm. is that it was scaled um, to the national level. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really the, the lesson and the model that it shows for the rest of us. Um, so Sonny, I want to turn to you. And I saw you taking a lot of notes. <laughs> so I want to invite you to react to what you just heard um, and, uh, and, and maybe comment on why is uh, this kind of community-based approach so important and unique? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Libby. Thank you, Madam Minister. Thank you, John. I think I was taking notes because uh, <laughs> I'm so fortunate to work here at USIP because we, we want to we create this type of platforms to allow this type of this kind of exchanges. And, Every time we have this opportunity, yes, we learn yeah. with humility. And uh, this is a learning platform for us and hopefully for the audience as well. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the book and thank you for documenting that experience because for me, the book and the experiences are acts of generosity. I think mm -hmm. you, you spend the time to document something unique, the, lo the expertise of local Sierra Leoneans. Uh, and the sense of innovation, the face of wicked problems. Mm. And really thank you for that. Okay. Thank you for your testimonies. I think a couple of things came to mind when I was listening. First, I was reminded uh, one, one author, uh, Hal Sanders, he used to work for USIP at some mm. time, who told me, Sunny, remember, Leaders sign peace treaties, but only people make peace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was, for me, as I was listening to you, I was reminded of that. Mm -hmm. That, yes, Fambuto is about people making peace. Yes, the peace treaty was signed, and then we had a quick fix. Mm -hmm. But you wanted people, you wanted to facilitate that peacemaking process between people. And that's key. It's key because they will own it. Yeah. That's how they build those relationships. Number two, there is something uh, a saying uh, credited to one of Chinese philosophers, but I think it's an African uh, wise man or woman <laughs> who said it, that if you want to work with the people, go live with them, 
love them, learn from them, start with what they know, build on what they have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, that's a demonstration yeah. of when you have the humility to learn from the people, you pretend to help. Yeah. When you love them, it means respect and dignity. And when you start with what they know, meaning that they are at the center yeah. of the issue, mm -hmm. because they experience that issue firsthand, mm -hmm. because they can frame the issue in their own terms, mm -hmm. not in consultant terms mm -hmm. or outsider terms. Mm -hmm. So they will own the issue. They will take the responsibility of the issue because they, ha they can identify and relate to that issue and the way the issue is described. And when you ground your intervention on, the lo on local resources, mm -hmm. they own it, they can afford it, they can sustain it, they can scale it up. Yeah. That's what we are seeing here. Yeah. Right? So for me, that's the approach. Right? So, and now as outsider, is I will borrow, I like, I mean, generally I grew up in a family where we tell stories, so I always take stories. <laughs> So I will borrow from President Kennedy who said, people need not hand out, but hand up. Mm -hmm. And so your intervention, when you recognize that, that the people are the framers, they own their issues, you ground your intervention on local resources, so now your intervention becomes a hand up, not a hand out. And so for me, those are the, that's my initial reaction here, as I'm listening and learning from these testimonies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny, um, and I couldn't agree more. It's an act of generosity that all of you have engaged in, and I think it's also an act of courage mm -hmm. to do things differently um, from each of your perspectives. So really appreciate um, what you've done and you're sharing it with us. Um, I wanna drill down a little bit uh, into um, your experiences and the, this case, um, and I wanna turn to John um, and ask you, John, to start with, um, what were the conditions that made it possible for you to launch this Inside Out program um, and, uh, and to scale it? What did you need from Catalyst for Peace to be able for, to do that? And what did you need for your, from your government to be able to, to launch that kind of an initiative? Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, first, it's commitment. Commitment to engage in the process. And I think from the start, Libby and I agreed to be part of the journey. I would say the co-creation, because it, it's not like a project. You know, peace building is a process. You know, it's not something you can say, OK, I will build five schools in one year. I will build um, three hospitals in six months. So it's a process, so it's that commitment commitment to accompany the process. That's basically um, the guiding principle of our partnership. You know, um, for us to be in the middle of um, engaging communities, something come up. You know, I'll have the courage to pick up the phone, to call Libby right there, and we agreed to work at chiefdom level. Because initially we agreed to work at the chiefdom level. You know, it's easy to say, okay, we're working, um, but then 161 chiefdoms by then. But then the people said, no, we want to have the conversation at the village level. Mm. So if it was another donor, he would say, ah, no, the indicators we agreed on is at the chiefdom level. So you cannot go back down. You know, so no, we need to sit that back you know, to have another meeting. So, and I, you know, I was able to explain to her. She said, well, if that's what the people want, let's go through that process. So it's an imagined design. We respond to um, the issues that come up. So, okay, the people said we want to work at village. We said, mm, okay, can we work at cluster level, you know, like the sectional level, the smallest unit, is about five to 10 villages. So that's how we started. But now with the partnership with the government, we've gone down to the village level to have structures at each village, to have their own um, monthly meetings, to agree on what they want to do, to agree on how they want to go about it. You know, sometimes it's, it's really unfortunate. You go to a community, what you see, is in your lens, it's poverty. You don't look for values. You don't look for um, what they have, you know, the success, you know, um, the resources they have. 
You just say, oh, these are people who are poor. And that's the lens she comes Okay, you go to a village, um, you see women walking to the stream. You say, oh, these people, oh, they are so poor, they cannot even afford to have a borehole. Mm -hmm. Let me come and help them to build a borehole in the middle of the town. That might be a um, problem for the women. Because maybe the walk to the stream is their downtime. That's when they talk about their kids. That's when they talk about their husbands. That's when they talk about development within the village. So if you come in, you think you come in with a genuine um, intention, but because you did not consult with them, you cause more problem. So basically, um, it's important to have partnership, co-creation, you know, to work this way. And as Libby said, that was how we started, you know, for the first um, say ten to twelve years. Although the partnership have evolved. You know, now, we're, now we are more of program partners. But it was really important to get to this stage you know, using that approach. Now for the government, I really feel I am so privileged. I am so fortunate to lead a program that starts from the community. You know, I remember my first encounter with my president was in Paris, you know, where we spent like 30 minutes. And he was, he, he was connecting. With the project, say, oh yes, I know, yes, we went to that village, yes, I saw it. So it's more of the commitment. For the government, it's not just the commitment from the leadership, it's the ministerial commitment. You know, the way we work, you know, is how do you avoid working in silos? Mm -hmm. How do you get um, the ministries to collaborate? You know, to, you know, like we, through the Office of Vice President, we have a steering committee. You know, um, we have three ministers who actually um, take, who make decisions. But the technical committee, these are the directors, you know, that brainstorm and forward the recommendation. So mostly it's commitment. That is really what is uh, needed to work this way. And also, I would say patience. You know, working on peace building, on innovative processes, it's difficult to give a time frame. So we have to trust the process. You know, of course, resources are very much important, and the government have demonstrated their um, commitment by you know, allocating those small, but it's the symbolic allocation. With all the problems, all the challenges, they said, this is really important. It's in the national budget. This is the way to go for us as a nation. Let's find ways to respond to the, um, to the needs of the communities. In October, we had a big event in um, Kono District, we are, you know, the leadership, the vice president, and a couple of ministers. We are there for three days listening to ordinary people in the same room, from the village to the council leaders, to the traditional leaders, to the ministers, all in the same room. I think, you know, and before then, we also went to the communities to see what they are doing, have that conversation. I think the courage to engage at that level mm. is really what is um, important to work this way. And of course, there are challenges. You know, um, how do you keep the program uh, non-political? You know, we are we are approaching uh, um, elections. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you make sure that you know this is not seen as party A's program or party B's program? Mm -hmm. It's seen as working for the people of Sierra Leone. It's an approach that will help alleviate, you know, the people into um, a position that they decide on what they want and how they want to go about it. It's a unique privilege. I really don't take it for granted. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Libby, could I turn to you and ask, um, from the perspective of Catalyst for Peace, what is it that you had to do to support this kind of inside out growth mm. and the drivers coming from the inside out versus in development is often driven from the outside, yeah. or at least that's the perception. Yeah. Um, so what, what did your foundation need to do to support that? How did it need to adjust? And yeah, one of the, thank you, it's, I think it's a great question. And even that question includes within it a part of the assumption of my answer, which is I had to do something, right? Like <laughs> I was a part of the system, mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't about just, as being a funder, giving to people, local people who were leading, right? And I'm outside of and disconnected from, but actually a part of creating a whole system. Um, and so how do I work within that whole system in ways that are constructive and that are actually supporting and strengthening local leadership? And there's a couple things I would say, one is an orientation. I had to come in first and foremost, not as an expert, mm -hmm. but as a learner. And what that means is if I really believe that the answers are there, 
Um, how do I go in and create the space to help identify, ask for, invite, learn um, from those answers that are there and then share them out like that. So there's just an orientation as a learner. Now, um, and I had to continually work to let go. Of, I've been, you know, all my training was about you get more success in this work the more of an expert you are. Like it was all building towards a certain notion of expertise. And it's not that you're not cultivating that, but I had to put that aside um, and continually reinforce that engagement. I am, I am really here as an I'm bringing my expertise, and a lot of it is process expertise. And kind of in nerdy program programmatic language, what it required to actually support local leadership was what we call um, nested circles of learning at, at every level. Mm -hmm. When you're using, um, when you're really putting local people and communities in charge, you, you don't know exactly, you have a program outline, but you, you don't know exactly what they're gonna, if you ask them what they wanna do, what they're gonna, you know, and how you're gonna, how it's gonna emerge. And so we had to create um, what we called a learning and immersion design platform, um, where it is you're creating learning spaces to gather that that learning, to look at what's it's like an action reflection loop, um, to reflect on the action that's happening. What are we learning? What's working? What's not working? How do we need to adapt? How do we need to to build? So we used immersion design. And we used a learning and immersion design platform that was building these spaces. So for example, the first after the first six months of the program, we brought John and the senior staff outside of that context mm -hmm. for a spacious week together to reflect mm -hmm. um, and to think about what we had learned from that and how we were gonna do, um, revise the program as a, as a result. And we instituted a regular cycle of those kinds of things. Process things, learning and reflection spaces. And again, none of my training, either academically or professional culture was ever really talked about the importance of learning spaces. Mm -hmm. But to actually do the work on the ground, I think that was one of the most valuable things. And we invested a lot of our resources in these learning spaces in country and outside. And then within that, the staff had their own version of that. They got together every month for staff meetings where they shared what was happening in the different districts. Um, and it was those meetings that became both a source of the, the staff supporting each other, doing difficult work, but it was learning exchanges were really facilitated. It was like this major, um, uh, it, it just sped up the learning inc incredibly so that you're sharing what's working here and what's working here and that just magnified it. And also raised the challenges and they were the resources as a staff that decided how they wanted to address the challenges. So you're creating the spaces that allow the resource and the expertise that's there to, to come forward. Now that was three days a month plus the expenses of getting there and gathering for the staff to do it. And as we faced budget cuts, I would always say, no, you can cut other things, but don't cut that. That is the heartbeat of this work, is that's how you learn, that's how you magnify the, um, the growth. So those learning spaces, and that one other um, thing that I would say is an expansive definition of time. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we said, um, that, that we've learned is that you have to go slow to go fast. Go slow, create the space for people to make their own decisions, build the infrastructure of community-based decision-making, um, and then structures at each level, including organizationally. And when you take the time to do that, then the growth actually happens exponentially mm -hmm. after that. But you have to go slow at first. And I had to learn how to counter all of my, okay, but you know, this doesn't seem like it's work. This doesn't seem like it's, you know, moving this forward. Like all of my desire to move things forward, I had to really learn how to see the process itself, the tending to relationship, the tending to community building, the reflection space, the learning space. This was actually the engine of not only growth, but sustainable. So you had to be willing to take a risk in the beginning when you weren't seeing. Huge risk, huge risk, which you can do when there's relationships of trust. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you for that. Um, I also just, a quick follow-up question for you. Um, to what extent did you work with international donors and can you share positive experiences that you had or examples mm. of working with international donors 
um, over the decade and a half that you've done this work in Sierra Leone. So you, you talk about um, how international donors work in your book, yeah. uh, and there's some you know, not so positive examples, yeah. um, but I'm wondering if you can share some positive examples. Sure, and actually, John, you probably have some examples of that of that too, and I can I sense that you um, might. But the from my experience, first of all, I would say the field, and and I'm coming as a private philanthropy mm -hmm. philanthropist, and so that's completely <coughs> different than government and intergovernmental um, uh, arena. I have seen in the field of private philanthropy, I have seen when we first started, this idea of local ownership was just like we were one of the only voices us and maybe Peace Direct. And that, the, the field of locally owned and led peace building from a private philanthropy has really grown and take off. And we just came from meetings yesterday with um, like the Siegel uh, Foundation and uh, Madre and Rockefeller Brothers Fund and, and others, Radical Flexibility Fund. And they're all like, there's this burgeoning of, of um, not only new organizations, but new programs within organizations that recognize, okay, we have to transform the way we work. So that experience as a field is really growing in incredibly gratifying ways. Um, and within, within our work, I mean, we did one of the, um, uh, of our, um, um, so we've had g great experiences. I would say most recently, um, one of the things, as we've been working with the government and to adapt this community mobilization process to a, um, uh, a national policy framework, you know, anytime you're working with a national government, it's complex. It takes a long time. Um, and we have, and this is at the time where Catalyst for Peace was pulling back our funding and no longer up, uh, able to fund. But we needed more funding to carry over the process a as you reach this in increasing complexity. And we've had three grants from Humanity United to support the work as it's been emergent, um, recognizing that the process of developing government ownership and capacity takes time. Right, so this last year was the first year that the One Fumble Framework was incorporated in the national budget. But we started those conversations four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and Humanity United has given us, we just got our, our third grant from them for the framework, uh, basically immersion, uh, emergence process um, and I think they understand that in real life process takes time change takes time and um, and they believe in the learning process yeah. of, of doing it and so that's an example yeah. um, of, a, of a kind of funding partnership that's yeah. been um, supportive yeah. very helpful thank you um, Minister Algali I want to come back to you um, and ask you uh, in terms of political uh, commitment or other resources, what did it take for your government to be able to continue to engage with this partnership as I know it has over time, to sustain it, and if you can share any hurdles that you've experienced um, in terms of the government being able to adopt and embrace the One Fumbul framework and in, incorporate it into the national budget, um, you know, what were, the, what were the challenges? Thank you very much for the question. In the first place, the agenda of the government is human capital development. So in terms of political commitment, we do not lack it as far as this process is concerned. And we were lucky for the fact that the Local Government Act was being reviewed during at this point in time. And it was a good opportunity for us to institutionalize the, the, the process so that even if the subsequent governments, unless they review the act or they change the act, that is the official government policy. If you want to do de uh, development and service delivery at the local level, the processes that you have to go by is using the people's planning process and the one family framework. So that was really a positive thing and the government was committed to that. So once it became part of the policy, it was easy to allocate resources to it. Mm -hmm. It's part of the government program. It's not just a project that you would have to seek uh, additional funding or extra budgetary reallocation to, to, for it. One of the challenges now is, you know that some of our programs are donor funded, like to get big institutions like the World Bank, to, to see this as part of 
government uh, uh, agenda and to try to see how that can be incorporated into the country strategy. But it's work in progress. We are working on it. And uh, I believe there are positive signs from both the World Bank. I think the, the, the vision, the, there has been a change. There has been a, a slight shift in the perception of the, the international community about doing development. There has been a, a, a slight shift. There's now a talk about local ownership, about con contextualizing development and all of that. So it's, uh, it's uh, positive for initiatives like this to get additional support to enable the government to, to roll it out. However, there is the need for technical support and technical expertise. For example, uh, the government now has uh, Fumble Talk, who are, it's their baby, it's their program. They are the, the, the owners of the concept, more or less. We have adopted it as a government, but we do not have the technical expertise to roll it out without the support of Fumble Talk. There is need for, for training, there is need for capacity building at the ministerial level both within the Ministry of Local Government and the Ministry of Planning and Development to take this forward. How we do that is another hurdle that we, we, we need to climb and we need to, to, to set that out. But we have the National Steering Committee and we have the Technical Committee. We hope that within those spaces, we will try to develop the, the necessary framework. Mm -hmm. But as both John and uh, Libby have said, it's a process. Yeah. It's, it's uh, not uh, a project. We are talking about having a five-year plan, a five-year plan, maybe a three-year cycle of, 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 of implementation. After that, we evaluate, and then go another three-year cycle. So it's not something that can be done today. But there's a commitment, there's a political will. I hope I continue to be in the office of the vice president <laughs> to see <laughs> to see to see this this uh, through. But uh, I believe uh, as a government realizing the potential and realizing the value of uh, doing development in this way and building social cohesion in this way, I think it's a very big step and I would want other governments to emulate, emulate this kind of thing because it would really minimize some of the conflict situation and some of the underdevelopment that we see at the rural level. Thank you. Um, so I want to, uh, we, we've been going for about an hour now, so I, I want to look forward a little bit um, before we go to the Q&A. Um, and I want to ask you all um, what your aspirations are for this model in Sierra Leone going forward and beyond. Um, to what extent do you think that this model can be replicated in other places? So with that particular question, I think I'll start with, with Sani. Um, what are your thoughts on, given all the conversations that are going on um, in capitals about aid localization um, and elsewhere? You know, to what extent can we expect to see this model replicated are there places or sectors where you think um, conditions are ripe for this, um, where we're more likely, this is more likely to work than others? Um, if, I'll turn to you for that, Sonny, to, to uh, kick us off. Yes, I, <coughs> thank you. I don't think it's about sectors. I think it's about context, it's, mm -hmm. it's really the context. And uh, listening to the minister, I think, and to Libby and John, I think that there are a couple of things that need to happen or take place, be present. You have one commitment. Mm -hmm. You need that local commitment, yeah. critical, the political will, yeah. right? And so you need that, number one. So I call it the first C, so to speak. Number two, she mentions it. You need capacity. You need the local capacity to either be able to adapt or absorb mm -hmm. a new process. So you need that technical capacity to allow the scaling up or the replication. That's the second C. The third C, I, my view, you need a demonstration of contribution. 
-hmm. Like for example, the government is putting down a down payment, making a down payment. Mm -hmm. And then now, so that's a contribution. They have the, tec the technical steering committee, etc. So that's the third C. Mm -hmm. And the fourth C, I think, you need the really net, so an attitude of co-learning. Mm -hmm. so, so you want a space that facilitates learning and co-learning, inviting others, mm -hmm. right? So, and then all those forces call for a paradigm shift. Yes. A paradigm shift from the donor community and also from our partners in the South. So those are, I think, as I said, the context. It's really, those forces for me are critical and call for that paradigm shift. I will stop. Thank you. Um, so maybe I'll open this up, this question up to the three of you um, as to what are your aspirations for the One Fumble Framework for Fumble Talk <laughs> going forward? <laughs> it's, it's difficult to, <laughs> to, to <laughs> say that. Very uh, open question. It, it really just summarized it all. Um, I'll just add one word. Respect. It's important for the donor community to engage in a respectful way. You know, uh, and I, I think what I'm trying to say is not to go in with um, an outside agenda, but to be able to go in respectfully, you know, to listen to um, what the people want and respond to their needs through the central government. So more or less, I think uh, they should be willing to sit together. Mm -hmm. I would say we should be willing, but more, I mean, as I'm still a civil society person, but we should be willing to sit together to have that conversation. You know, we are in um, the government, the donor community, um, community representatives through the local government, uh, you know, the traditional leaders, you know, they are able to sit together to see what can be done and not just to dismiss you know, uh, local concerns or local needs mm -hmm. as if uh, they don't know what they want. So I would say respect across the board. How do you integrate this program, as Sunny said, into existing um, programs you know, without thinking, you know, we have this program, we've developed it. You know, oh, no, we cannot change. Mm -hmm. So it's that humility to respond. That's all I can add. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, John, for that. Um, Minister, maybe if I can turn to you next. Yes, um, I would like to see this program become the how to do development in Sierra Leone. It, I would like to see this program really, really take root mm. as to how to do development in Sierra Leone. We are in the process of developing a new national development plan uh, in Sierra Leone. And one of the commitments that um, the president and the honorable vice president have made is to use the model to see how that can inform the national development plan going forward. I think in the near future, we, that is what we would want to see and how that evolves. And that would also give added value to how this program moves to the next level, how we can use it to do the national development plan and how we can use it to implement the new national development plan, the how. So these are my aspirations for the program. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Libby? <laughs> I think I have a bigger laundry list. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, in addition to what, to what you all are saying, I want to see the work grow. I want to see the government really build the cross-ministerial collaborative space that I think is going to be necessary mm -hmm. um, for the actual implementation and for the, its engagement as a government as a whole vis-a-vis -vis the larger international donors. Um, and that you're moving in that direction. I want to continue to see that, that grow and strengthen. Um, I want to see um, the work of community mobilization that Fumble Talk has really modeled, spending the time to that. I want to see that continue to be valued and all of the other, whether it's local government, um, traditional leaders, or national government, cultivate the patience to really, that it takes, I think, to, to work in that way to build the processes for community mobilization. 
And then I would say at a global level, you know, we've started to really dip our toes in um, the global learning space. Um, and just like, as I was describing, when you had Fumble Talk staff that were leading work in one district, coming together with those that were leading it in another and sharing from, from that space, we've had a few different global learning events in Sierra Leone. And whenever we've brought practitioners from other countries, the first thing we hear is, wow, this gave me hope. Mm -hmm. First of all, there's something about seeing and experiencing an example of a program that's working. And when you visit the communities in Sierra Leone and you see what they're able to do with the few resources that they've had and after the devastation of war and then Ebola and all of that, that they are not defined by the problems that they faced, but by what their visions for what they want to do and what they've been able to do. Um, and the agency that they hold as a community, I mean, it, to me, it feels almost like this infinite resource. And I want to bring other people in um, to see and to be inspired by that. And I, the, the thing that we've found a lot of great success with mm -hmm. is creating experiences, and, and I want to see more of this. I think that the people like John, um, in civil, the civil society leaders leading other work, the people like the staff and the community members in Sierra Leone, the people like Minister Al Ghali, the government ministers that are the visionary people who are working to forge this, other funders who have this vision. Mm -hmm. um, when we can bring other people who are those kinds of visionary leaders from one context together with those practitioners in other contexts and create cross-learning experiences they learn the most from each other. Um, and so the, the team that we had from Somalia, for example, um, at a global learning event there, the team that we had from Kenya, the team that we had um, you know, from Afghanistan, right? Not only did they share their experiences of trying to do a large scale community, either community driven de development or national community reconciliation process like the Zimbabwe, um, but they learned a ton and had the inspiration. Mm -hmm. And so what I would love to see, this is, I, I think there's so much untapped potential mm -hmm. from creating spaces for practitioners, mm -hmm. not just to share head knowledge, but to create real embodied, immersive learning experiences. And again, you have to go slow to go fast. They take more time, um, but they, they open up the kind of learning that is transformational. And one part of that, you mentioned the word risk mm -hmm. and courage that it takes. I mean, I will say to anybody, I think John is one of the most courageous people that I know, and he has been consistently over his life. Minister Algali also, the courage that it takes, this work, when you're forging something new, mm -hmm. it takes a level of courage. And I think rather than making it courage against the odds, we can actually create space that encourage <laughs> courage, right? That we address the internal dimensions of leadership that we can create. What if we could create spaces that recognize what it took and explicitly made that leadership development a part of, um, of the, the program? How do we develop the, the courage? Of, because the courage is there also. There are always visionary leaders in a context, even the most, I liked your definition of the wicked problems, right? <laughs> even in the, the sites of the most wicked conflicts, there are courageous visionary leaders. How can we support mm. their courage? It doesn't take much, it just takes acknowledging. That's another dimension of inside out. We have to look at the inside of what it takes to work this way and create the spaces and kinds of learning communities that support our capacity to do that. So that's just a little bit of what I'd like to see. That's <laughs> extremely helpful. Thank you, Libby. And you kind of summarized a lot of what we've been talking about. So I really appreciate that wrap up. Um, so I want to move in. Uh, we have gotten a lot of interest from our viewers in the conversation. Um, and questions have been trickling in. So I want to turn to some of them. We're not going to have time to address all of them. But um, I want to turn to three questions. And I'm just going to maybe start with Sani. And, uh, and feel free to respond um, to any aspect uh, of these questions. So the first one is, um, how do you measure impact? Um, so I think the question is specifically about development, but it could be about peace as well, um, in the kind of work that you're doing. 
So what are the, how do you know what the results are? Uh, this is a very Washington question. <laughs> so it's fair <laughs> to ask you this here. Um, but how do you measure impact? How, how are you tracking that? So that's the first question. Second one is um, a comment and a question, which is that peace building seems to really be on the cutting edge of localized approaches, which I agree with that premise. Um, how can we, as peace builders, help to transfer our knowledge about working locally to other sectors, to other parts of the mm -hmm. development sector? So I think you touched on this already, Libby, but if you have any other thoughts, um, so how do we you know, bring that knowledge from the peace building sector into other sectors? And then third um, is a question about US programs, and to the extent that you were familiar with Peace Corps, a question about whether you think the Peace Corps works from the mm. inside out. Mm. Um, or maybe are there other US programs that work this way? Mm. So uh, <laughs> with that, uh, feel free to, to answer any part of those three questions, and I will turn it over to Sunny. <laughs> those are tough ones. <laughs> <laughs> I think on the question of impact, I think, uh, again, we have all these log frames, all these instruments. I think we have to think even the measurement of impact differently from that model mm -hmm. of uh, who should define success, who should define impact, mm -hmm. and who should define indicators, right? So, and I think there is one conversation missing, which is how do we work with the local expect to define the, the measurement, the evaluation framework itself. I think that's, the, that's I think that the new paradigm we should. Mm -hmm. We cannot ignore uh, locals, local practitioners like John, in that definition of the framework of impact. Right? So I will leave it there. I think we are missing that in the current system of MEs and mm -hmm. learning. How many are learning? I think we are missing that first mm -hmm. key uh, step, is how do we work together to co-create those frameworks before yeah. even diving? Generally, those frameworks are created in capitals or by donors yes. without local involvement. So, and then not just involvement as tokenism, but actually people saying, because we have framed the problem, because we have designed or co-designed the solutions, we also, we are well qualify to define what success is yeah. and how you measure success. I will, I will take that question of because I think the rest, I think my co-panelists are qualified. <laughs> Thanks, Sonny. Uh, John, could I turn to yes. you? I'll take the second question, which is um, how do we transfer um, peace building knowledge to other sectors? I'll, I see peace building as the foundation mm. for all other programs to thrive on. You know, take for example the health sector, you know, even the schools. Um, in order for schools to operate effectively, the community should be whole. You know, um, where do you build the school? Do the people feel that they own the school, not just the structure, but I mean, are they comfortable to send their kids to school? You know, are they interested in what is happening in the schools? Are they supporting the teachers? Mm -hmm. You know, because like in some communities in, in Sierra Leone, you, you know, you have teachers who come from the big towns to work in the small towns. How do you support them to stay? So I, I see peace building as the foundation. And by that I mean if the communities are able to decide on what they want, mm -hmm. they are able to own the process, they are able to lead what they want, all other things will fall into place easily. Things like agriculture. You know, we've seen where you, you supply fertilizers very late. You know, the planting season. You give seeds very late. Because, I mean, what do people do? You know, you build um, a market structure where the people don't want the market structure. And so in the end, they don't, they, they don't use it. So basically, transfer of knowledge can be through having that conversation. You know, peace builders are part of the system. So you don't just come in as a development practitioner but you engage with uh, the stakeholders, you know, uh, the community leaders, uh, the peace builders, in order to sort of uh, so say, heal the communities, heal the divisions within those, those communities, and get them to be in a stronger position to decide on what they want 
and to lead the process moving forward. I'll just take that one. Thank you, John. And Minister? Okay, there was a question about uh, impact. How do you measure? How do you measure this? How do you measure this? I'll throw. I will throw the the question back <laughs> through uh, a testimony. There was a woman when we went to Kono, who stood up when the vice president was there. Kono is a place in Freetown, and said, um, "I like this one fumble framework. These people's planning process before." I wasn't even able to talk, stand up and talk in a gathering. But now, through this one family framework, where we have all been called together to talk about what we want and how we want to develop ourselves, I am now able to talk what I want. I am now able to discuss with my husband. I can now go out and do things on my own. So I feel empowered. How do you measure that kind of impact of a program? It's only through maybe testimonies, only through maybe change mm. from one state to another. And what indicators would you use to measure that kind of change? When you have women taking leadership before, hitherto they were not even talking. So how do you measure impact? <laughs> And just to add to that, if I, <laughs> it just fits very well into what um, Sani was saying. How do you involve community people to define their yeah. own what is, yeah. you know, impact? Impact, yeah. their own the indicators. indicators. Exactly. So, you know, it's all about having that conversion and involving the people. Don't do things from your office. Yeah. Don't do things from the headquarters, but involve people. So at the end of the day, the impact is measured with the lens of either the people or from you as a donor yeah. or you know your colleagues as practitioners yeah thank you both libby well who defines impact is what i hear you saying and, uh, and i think that's sort of the key question who are we who who gets to define impact um and i want to i don't feel like i have anything else to add to that particular conversation i think you said it really beautifully um, except I would say, I think part of the conversation is actually um, for whom are we defining it? <laughs> um, are we defining it for an external person's validation or not, or you know, approval or not of a programming, or are we defining it for internal learning purposes? And how do we do that? I think there's, um, there are some really good tools for that, and I think it's a mindset as much as, as everything. How do we build in the, the internal learning loops that allow us to adapt, to harvest our own learning? From my perspective, because I've seen so much learning harvested from the communities, from uh, at, at that level. I've seen so much learning harvested from the staff. I've seen so much learning from, harvested from the government, certainly from our, our international perspective. And how do we harvest more of that learning and channel it into the ongoing program development and adaptation? And I think that's something, um, although we've developed a platform for it connected to this, I think there's a lot more potential um, for using that lens um, so that you're building these, um, these loops that feed explicitly back into um, to the community. And along that lens, I think there's a positive, one of the things that we, one of the roles that we felt we played as an outsider was a, an appreciative mirror mm -hmm. to simply reflect back what you were seeing in positive ways. And I know for myself, whenever I experience that, mm -hmm. It helps me see things about myself and strengthen my sort of stance in those in ways that I don't, um, that help me. And I see that happening in Sierra Leone all the time with John and the staff it, to the communities, with our um, international partners to John and his staff. Like it's just, when you, when you build that in, the appreciative mirror, it serves as an explicit strengthening and, and magnification. Um, so I think that's a question for us to take up and to, to spend more time with mm -hmm. also. Um, I would just say about uh, peace building, 
One of the things, I, I, I see peace building as an orientation um, in a way of bringing together things that aren't often together. And it can be people or it can be warring groups, but it can also be, um, you know, so um, sectors, peace building and development. And when you're working in a local community, these sectors aren't separate. It's not like you have even education and healthcare, peace building and development, like they're all sort of woven together in the community experience. And, but so many of our problem solving systems split them apart. So there's actually a need for, I think, a peace building orientation around reclaiming a more holistic um, infrastructure for supporting this. The other thing that where I think there's more of a peace building lens needed is building the linkages, the vertical linkages, from village to section to chiefdom to district to, to national and to, and to international. And creating the, the space, and this is one of the things that I think the One Fumble National Framework is really pioneering is, how do we create the spaces at the national level where the people saying what they want, like there is a channel for them to be heard, and you described a practical example of that, and then for that to feed back in and define development. And I think there's, it's not peace building as a separate task, it's a peace building orientation built into how do we create the linkages between the levels. Um, and so it's peace building informing program development mm -hmm. um, that I think um, there's probably still a lot more to be explored. And that could be a much more expansive under definition of the term than the, the questioner um, meant. And I don't, um, I, I, you know, I, I would leave it to you to define peace core and whether that, uh, I mean, from my perspective, I have felt like the Peace Corps workers that I know, that I'm, people who have served in the Peace Corps, um, because of the commitment to living in a place um, and learning and accompanying, um, have a much more internalized understanding of this idea of the expansive notion of time that we've been talking about as as critical and of not coming in as an outside expert, does, you know, coming to fix and to save, but uh, somebody who's walking alongside, helping to identify and magnify and support um, the resources that are there. That's been my experience of it, and that's from a, a point of remove. Um, but it's at least the, the part that I've observed. I, I think um, in general it's a really good model um, for, for a lot, yeah. Great, well thank you so much. Uh, we're coming to the end of our, uh, of our panel discussion. Um, I wanna thank our panelists. Uh, I wanna thank you for your leadership. I wanna thank you for your generosity as we've been discussing. I wanna thank you for your courage. Mm -hmm. Um, and mostly, I think I want to thank you for inspiring the rest of us through your example. Um, and I have heard uh, th these programs talked about often enough that I know you're having an impact. Um, and I know on a personal note, you've inspired me. <laughs> and I plan to continue to follow what you're doing and to be inspired. So thank you very much for everything that you do. Um, I want to thank our viewers as well, um, those who have joined us online for this conversation. And hopefully there will be more to come. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.